we've had one discussion on women in India earlier in the day. In this session, two feasty women talk about women in the 21st century. Author, social critic, and political activist Naomi Wolf challenged the cosmetics industry with her bestseller, The Beauty Myth, and launched a new wave of feminism in the early 1990s. Her latest book was Vagina, a new biography. Naomi is a co-founder of the Woodhull Institute for Ethical Leadership, which teaches leadership to young women and the American Freedom Campaign, a grassroots democracy movement in the United States. With a team of collaborators, she launched the website, Daily Cloud, designed to help build political clout and increase their activism. Also, uh, I would like to remind the audience that there's no tea break. We are just continuing with our next session. So please uh, settle down so we may begin. And to introduce our other panelists, Bharka Dath. She's the group editor with NDTV. She first emerged. <laughs> she first emerged as a household name with her frontline war reporting on the Kargil conflict in 1999. She has since reported from several conflict zones across the world, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. She has won over 40 national and international wow. awards. Bharka hosts the weekly award-winning talk show, We the People, and the daily primetime talk show, The Buck Stops Here. Over to you, ladies. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know where you were in the 1990s. Maybe many of you were too young to even remember. Uh, but for those of us of a certain vintage, I was in college. And, uh, yeah. and I remember reading, as a college student, Naomi Wolf's cult book, The Beauty Myth. And, and I know that it, it had a profound impact on so many of us who were still trying to define our gender politics, who were still trying to define where we stood vis-a-vis -vis feminism, by the way, it wasn't a bad word back then, as it seems to have become today. Um, and I have to say that the book, in many ways, along with other writers like Germaine Greer, for me personally, were really my first exposure to questions that lurked somewhere deep inside me, Naomi, but I hadn't even thought of asking. So thank you for beginning that process for us, and it is such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Well, it's such an honor to be in conversation with you and, um, and to be here at this amazing festival in this amazing city. Uh, and you were very kind in your introduction, so I appreciate it. And, and it's also exciting to kind of run into the women who are breaking barriers, um, you know, all over the world. I meet the women who are breaking barriers. And it's Thank exciting you. to meet you as well. I remember the first page of your book, The Beauty Myth, asked a question in 1991 that is just as valid and unanswered in 2014. And the question was that while women have made greater strides, if you look at just the surface, so you have more women in the workforce, you have more women in politics. In India, sometimes you could be misled into believing that women are really powerful because the leader of the opposition is a woman, the leader of the Congress party is a woman, we've had a woman president, the speaker in parliament is a woman. You asked back then, and I ask you that question today, are we as women freer than before? Well, when you say before, how far back do you want to go? Let's go back to the time you wrote The Beauty Okay, myth. that's a great question. I wonder if while I answer, I could ask our nice hosts to see if there's a pillow or a jacket or something I could put behind my back, because I'm finding that... I think someone will just Thank get you, you one. Yeah. Thank you. It was a 17-hour plane ride, so I'm... We a understand. Little, a little uncomfortable in the chair. Um, I, the answer is, you know... Thank you. How amazing. Thank you. So you should have asked for something better. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, in so, so I guess what I should say is the short answer is um, women never get credit for engineering revolutions in record time. And uh, in fact, the last 20, 25 years since The Beauty Myth was written about 22 or three years ago, it, everything I fantasized about as a baby feminist in many ways has come true in the sense that we're not there yet. Don't worry, I'm not saying we're there yet. But issues like, um, you know, 
the globalization of female poverty, genital mutilation, um, rape impunity, uh, child marriage, um, you know, wage inequity, these were seen as marginal feminist issues in the early 90s that weirdos called feminists cared about and serious people who were white men didn't really care about organically. These have now moved to the center of understanding in academic circles and policy circles. Mm. Smart people know they have to get it about women if they're going to solve environmental problems, if they're going to solve problems about poverty and education and development. Um, it doesn't mean the right things are always done, mm. but the questions are taken so much more seriously than they were. Um, in terms of, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I was sexually harassed and there was no law against it. When, you know, when I was a graduate student, young women at Oxford were, um, you know, were, were raped on campus, young women at Yale were raped on campus, and there was rape impunity. Like, there was still that thing of what were you wearing, or, you know, did you provoke it? The understanding, this is evolving, I know. I mean, I know there have been some high-profile cases in India that I've written about in my global column, high-profile cases in my home country, you know, all over the world. We're not free of this fight, but the idea that it's not the woman's fault, hmm. you know, if there's a sexual offense against her, that has radically changed, hmm. you know, for the better, at least that it's a hot uh, topic of discussion, um, that it shouldn't be her fault. Um, you know, other things are worse. I mean, the pornographization of culture hmm. has colonized young people's minds in a very insidious way, and neuroscience is showing how deep that colonization can go. And um, so in some ways, young women growing up, pardon my voice too, young women growing up in, in North America at any rate, um, are not as free to think about their own sexual identities as they might have been before this colonization, young men too. Um, but, but I have to say, what I'd like, what I'd like us to do, because the media never does it, is to say how extraordinary, it's not a sob story, you engineered a revolution, you engineered a revolution, you know, our older sisters, mm -hmm. our aunts, our moms, our grandmas engineered a revolution. The men who care about them mm -hmm. did. And the world my daughter and son are growing up in is so much better than the world that I grew up in and so much better than the world my mom it's, grew up in. It's so interesting that you mm -hmm. should say that because in many ways, I always feel that the glass ceiling was broken by the women who came before us. My own mother, for example, was a journalist uh, at a time when she walked into, the newspaper, into a newspaper to ask for a job. She was told that women are only allowed to cover flower shows. And, and, and so, you know, you know how far you've traveled. Right. Yet, let me be contrarian and say to you that while a lot of things seem to have changed on the surface, if you look at what the central argument of the beauty myth was, to me, in some ways, that construct, the, the, the business of being op oppressed, by the societal expectation mm -hmm. of a certain personification of beauty seems to have actually worsened. We no, live in a hyper-sexualized yeah, world in a way that true. we never did before. The internet has made pornography even more uh, all-pervasive. Mm -hmm. um, and without, and, and pornography, as you have documented, actually desensitizes people to sexual violence. And most of all, do we live in a time when you and I will sit here and say we are feminists, but I can bet you that if you put it to the audience here, a number of people would say yes, but, no, but. How did feminism get to be a bad word? So you're asking a couple of important questions in one, and I'm going to tease them apart if you don't mind, because they're, yeah. they're, they're both so important. So if, if you're saying, have beauty myth issues gotten worse? Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, both better and worse. Uh, better in the sense that I think if you talk to a 16-year-old in Chennai or in New York, they are likely to know that those images are computer manipulated or that they're unrealistic. But they right? still aspire to them. They do, but at least there's critical thinking going on. Mm. Um, and that wasn't true when I wrote the book. Uh, but some things like plastic surgery is much more you know, commonplace. It's not seen as marginal anymore. It's an expectation. Um, and the size of of models and celebrities, at least in North America, has, has shrunk to like skeletal proportions since even I wrote that book. Um, rates of anorexia and bulimia are stable, but as I predicted in the beauty myth, I predicted, and unfortunately it doesn't mean I'm particularly smart, just it was in inevitable to see this, that illnesses like anorexia and bulimia and body dysmorphia, meaning having a distorted idea of your body shape, which were almost unknown in the developing world and very prevalent in the developed world, 
it was predictable that they would travel all over the rest of the world and that's what's happening. So now when I, you know, go to, you know, Jordan or I, you know, come to India or whatever, I'm seeing the same pattern of the more education young women get, the more likely they are to have anorexia or bulimia or a distorted yeah. body image. Um, so I acknowledge that. But in a way, I sort of feel like that's the least of our problems. I mean, it's a problem, but it's not central. When I wrote The Beauty Myth, it was like the biggest thing I thought we were facing in the West. It's obviously mm -hmm. not the biggest thing in the rest of the world. But now I do feel like, and now I'm pivoting to your next question, if you were to say some pe people in the audience would say, yes, but I'm a feminist, I'm not a feminist. In a way, that doesn't bother, I mean, you may be annoyed at me because I'm just, I keep saying, uh, I see there's grounds for hope. That doesn't bother me the way, in some ways, it should. And here's why. I feel like all over the world where I travel these days, a lot of people don't identify with the word feminism for some stupid reasons and some great reasons, which we can get into, but they're doing feminism. Mm -hmm. You know, like the young women, I just met a 16-year-old girl who's won two national awards for writing short stories, a girl here in Chennai, and she gave me her book and, you know, asked for a follow-up <laughs> response. That's a very feminist way to behave. <laughs> you know, she was showing confidence, faith in herself, faith in her talent. Um, I see this all over the world. You know, I, you know in, in, in Yemen, I'm sorry, um, I, I, what's a, be a better example? Uh, the, the, some friends of mine did a movie that's been shortlisted for an Oscar about um, the uprising Tahrir Square, hmm. the square. Hmm. And it's a woman who directed it, a young woman. Um, and we're not saying, oh, you're a young woman who directed this. It's just the square, and hopefully she'll get an Oscar for it. Mm. Uh, is, does she identify herself as a feminist? I don't know, but I see this all over the world, that in this audience, people might not identify with feminism for a lot of smart reasons. I mean, when I'm in Amman, they don't identify with feminism because they see it as Western, which is an important thing to tease out because there's some ways I think Western feminism has made mistakes, which we can get into. And every time I come to India, I learn more about ways in which we've made mistakes. Mm. Do you identify with the word feminism? I mean, I do, but like most people, I then want to explain Qualify what I mean it? by it. No, define it. And how would you define it? Well, to me, see, this is very important. To me, feminism, like here's the dialectic. Feminism in the West has been recently in the last, I would say, 15 or 20 years, misdefined as a set of lifestyle choices or a set of ideological beliefs. You have to be pro-choice or liberal or, you know, or as a gender conflict, right? That's not what it's supposed to be. To me, and now I'm pivoting to what I do believe, and my first trip to India really crystallized this. To me, feminism is the logical extension of democracy. It's direct from the Enlightenment. It's the belief that everybody in the world whatever their gender is entitled to basic freedom and human dignity. And that whatever you do with that freedom and human dignity, I, thank you, is up to you. But because it's my job to ask the skeptical question, I would turn around and say, isn't choice a highly loaded word when it comes to gender? Because let's take a, a debate that no one's ever been able to resolve. Let's take the debate around the veil or the parda, mm -hmm. right? Or the burqa. There are any number of women I know who say, it is my choice. It is my choice to, to wear a burqa. It is my choice to wear a parda. There are equal number of women I know who say that the very idea of this is somehow uh, patriarchal. It is, it, it is misogynist by definition. Now, if you locate both of these in a context like France, for example, you have other notions like uh, whether a cultural hegemony should define women's choices. So choice is really complicated. So when you say feminism is an extension of democracy, you're essentially saying it's about choice, but how do women... I'm saying it's about freedom. Okay, the freedom. But is that too loaded a word when it comes to women? What do you mean by too loaded? What's your fear? Complicated that some people will choose to, to wear a burqa? Is that, what are, like, what are you anxious about? Let me put it to you like this, that when you spoke about the beauty myth, mm -hmm. you said women were aspiring to a certain idea of beauty that had been foisted on them by uh, essentially male society. But if I were to tell you, Naomi, it's my choice to be anorexic. Mm -hmm. It's my freedom to starve myself to mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. You would say that's not choice, that's not freedom, that's a construct. I'm you asking know, you how I, you I don't agree with what you said I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask more questions. Hmm. Because um, a mistake 
that feminism makes again and again and again is to tell women what to believe and how to behave. And that is just as reductive to women as autonomous, free, spiritual beings as patriarchy telling them what to think and how to behave. Thank you. Let me give you an example. And I really want to say that the headscarf is such an interesting example because when I travel to Eastern Europe or to Jordan, I meet hip, empowered, yeah. feminist, yeah. you know, aspirational, right on young women who are wearing the headscarf because to them it's about anti-colonialism yes. and Western, anti-Western imperialism. Yeah. And, it, and it, they are at categorical. That is their choice and their decision. And then when I write about this, I get attacked mm. in the West. Um, you know, when I, and all I'm doing is saying, let's listen to their definition. Right? Let's listen to what they have to say about it. So what I keep saying is, let's go back a step to a world, like to me a feminist world isn't everyone in this room dresses alike the way I want you to dress. You could look at what I'm wearing, and, and, and I've been in, in Muslim countries where people will look at what I'm wearing and think that's not freedom. You know, she's, she's commodifying herself, or she's, you know, she's not protected, you know, in various ways that, you know, would be seen as a loss. What's more important to me is do we... Do we live in a world in which everybody gets to have their opinion valued? I won't agree with you necessarily. I won't choose to wear a headscarf necessarily. But a world in which absolutely every woman around the world can decide how she wants to live and have the voice to say what those choices mean to her. Now, a feminist debate is, why do you feel that you need to starve? Or why, I want to know more about why you're covering yourself. Like, I saw a woman in Bahrain, a lot of women in Bahrain, who were covering their faces. I, rather than dictating, I'm curious. I want to hear that woman speak about what it feels like to her, and I want to know what kind of world she wants for her yeah. daughter. You know, and I want her to have the right to influence policy. You know, when she's influencing policy and making as much money as her male peers and no one's beating her up, maybe she'll wear, cover her face, maybe she won't. Mm. You know, but, but that's what's important. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and so I'm going to take it one step further. Oh. We really do a lot of harm <clears throat> to women and to feminism when we say it's not about every woman's right to live her life as she sees fit, it's about everybody agreeing with me. Because mm. when we do that... Well, first we lose numbers because of only always a fraction of yeah. people will agree with anyone. But also it's intellectually reductive. And it's not what the Enlightenment said. The Enlightenment said, you know, that if you go to first principles and give everybody equality of human dignity, you'll have arguments and you'll have democracy, you'll, you know, you'll have fights, you'll have strong differences of opinion. Um, but that's better than a world in which we're all walking lockstep, even if it reflects my fantasy of how things should be. No, I agree with you. I, I, I'm merely making the point that it can be argued uh, as passionately on both sides of the ideological spectrum, for example, when it comes to the partha, but so can it be on commodification. And it's so interesting that you brought this up because one of the debates that took place in India in the aftermath of the mass street protests after the Delhi gang rape mm -hmm. was on how our cinema depicts women. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a question that was raised by respected uh, people like Shabana Azmi and others who have spent a lifetime in cinema. And, and the question is this, that is hypersexualization of women necessarily more liberating than covering them from head to toe? Is right. the camera traveling over a navel in a, in, a, in a sort of salacious manner really liberating? And as a woman, I've never quite figured out the answer to this. Yeah, I mean, so this also is an important question, and I, I would really say that, to me as a feminist, the fact that we are having a lot of big cultural space to ask these questions is feminism, right? Yeah. That, yeah. That's important. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love this audience. Um, but it's interesting, my own reaction, when you were saying that part of what was happening in the debate after these rapes was an examination of how the media treated women, I, I'm feeling my heart rate rise with anger because... What does one have to do with the other? No, I'd go further than that. It's not women who are committing the rapes. Why aren't we looking at men? Why aren't we looking at the socialization of men? What's edu what, like, when is rape going to be treated like there's something wrong with, these, like, with how these young men got to this place in their lives? There's something not working. Something's failed mm. that they think that this is an okay thing to do to another human being ever. Mm. Like, why, aren't we, why are we always looking at women? 
when something bad happens to women. It's the men who are, you know, it's the rapists who raped. Yeah. Where's my applause line there, you know? <laughs> and I, I, thank you. I should clarify, I don't mean demonize men as a gender. I mean, look at what happened to these young men to have, like, I would say that what happens when there's a rape is, appalling for the victim. Obviously, I've got a whole chapter in Vagina about the neuroscience of rape, that rape never leaves your body and your mind unless you have very, very specialized treatment. They can measure rape in saliva of women who've been raped. I mean, it changes your autonomic nervous system response. There's incredible new science in my book about this. But it's just as awful to me as the mother of a son to think that a young man could be so dehumanized and so alienated from everything that makes him good, you know, that he could do this to another human being. That's the thing and, to look and, at. And yet the truth of it is that at least we here in India are still a society that stigmatizes the woman who's been raped instead of the rapist. The fact that we are still grappling with for example, the law does not permit us, unless the woman chooses otherwise, to reveal the identity of a woman who's been raped, which I understand. But that is the law here, and it reflects. It reflects something about the stigma. And I'll give you an example. I met the mother of a young girl who lived in Bombay who'd been murdered and sexually assaulted before she'd been murdered by the guard in her building. And the mother who came on one of my shows, I made a factual error, and I said she was raped and then killed. She was sexually assaulted and then killed. And the mother said, she was not raped, she fought for her honor. And I didn't want to argue with the mother because I understood mm. what that emotion was, but I was so disturbed that honor was somehow linked. The dishonor Wait, is the rapist. Can I understand, if she was successfully raped, she lost her honor, is that the idea? In a sense, yes. Oh. And that is the truth of the society we live in. That's and a serious problem. It is a serious yeah. problem. And I wanted to go back to something you said in the beginning when you said it has become much better since you wrote The Beauty Myth because today there isn't that impunity. I actually think there is, even though there is an inflection point when it comes to gender in India. If you were to ask any young woman in this audience, including myself, have we faced harassment at some point in our lives? The answer would be yes. Have we had our bottoms pinch, our breasts pawed? Have we been felt up in public transport? I do not oh. know, I do not know right. a girl of my generation and younger to whom this did not happen. Yet we are so brutalized that we would probably turn around and say it's a small thing because we weren't raped. Yeah, oh Jesus, really? I think so. Yeah, I mean this is one reason it's, I'm glad to be here. Um, you know, from news reports, and I'm not, you know, every country has their ways of brutalizing women. I'm not singling out any one country, but it does seem as if there is impunity for certain kinds of sexual violence here that is institutionalized. Um, and what happens if a woman on public transport starts to shout and say, this man is pinching my bottom? What, does he get arrested or no one pays attention? Ooh, we've or? all slapped a man shouted at him. I think we've all done that at different times. But when it happens repetitive, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a so pattern, it's, a, it's, it's a not fact. rare. It's, so can I have a, sh like, can we do a show of hands? Yeah. So if you're just walking in the street, like what's, who has had this experience of being handled on the street? Oh. Everyone yeah. here who's ever faced harassment in your lives, please raise your hands. Yeah, that's so interesting. It, wow, that's a substantial number. In America, you'll get verbal harassment on the street, but people don't touch you usually. Um, uh, or, or it's, you know, ugh. And it's, here we'd yeah. say to ourselves, yes. it's almost treated as a rites of passage in your adolescent years or your teenage years because you'd go back home and maybe concerned parents would tell you, you might get killed if you fought back. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so terrifying. It is terrifying. And, and, and I'm saying these things are changing, but yeah. it would be a pretense to say that it's all gone. And if a woman, so if a woman shouts and, you know, in, in a public place and says, this man has touched me, he doesn't get arrested or a policeman doesn't come or they don't take it seriously. They don't it take would be different custody. today. In mm. this moment in India, it would be different today. But I would because say two of the media scrutiny. Because of the media uh -huh. scrutiny. But I would say two years ago, it may not have been different. And I'm not sure that it would right. remain different. I understand. So I want to say something because um, I've looked at PTSD a lot because uh, I'm persuaded that PTSD is a huge part of how women get to be conditioned to be women. And if women are being handled like that in the street and being told, 
it, you're lucky you weren't raped or you could have been killed if you fought back, then they are being traumatized on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. And if you're being traumatized, it does change how your brain functions, you know, and it's like a way of, I mean, traumatizing population is a way of keeping them under control. And it's very, very, very serious. So I'm just like validating what you're saying and saying that even the neuroscience of how the brain is rewired when you're terrified again and again and again mm. um, should lead legislators in India to take this much, much more seriously. Mm. You wrote early on about, in The Beauty Myth and other writings since then, about how pornography desensitizes one to sexual violence. Yeah. Where does that reconcile with books like Fifty Shades of Grey doing as well as they do? Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> That's, so what was that? I think they agree with the question. Oh, they're, they're happy that you asked it. That's yeah. interesting. It's a, it's a great, they're all great questions. Um, so, so interesting. When a woman is having a fantasy, she's not actually being raped, right? And... Um, there's nothing uh, sexy or arousing about actual sexual violence. On the contrary, even in my book, um, Vagina, it shows neuroscience, it's recent about female arousal, that women need their autonomic nervous systems to be um, activated, to get really aroused. And the thing that closes that down is stress or resentment or fear. So this is very important just in day-to-day -day, you know, life as a couple or with a lover because you have to be nice to a woman to want her to have sex with you all the time, you know, which to me as a feminist is an important thing to know, right? <laughs> um, but also, you know, moving it back to your question, uh, apparently neuroscience, neuroscientist Jim Faust at Concordia University is my kind of um, mentor for this, have explained that there's a big difference between what the female brain perceives as good stress and bad stress, and good stress can be arousing. And so Fifty Shades of Grey, when you're fantasizing, if rape, fantasies or spanking fantasies or, you know, fantasies with domination, submission, turn you on, that's all, you're in control of that, right? So that, the brain experiences that as good stress. It heightens your autonomic nervous system response. Does this make sense to you? Well, yes, if you want me to keep going, I can explain it. No, what I mean is, are you comfortable with the idea? My question is a little different. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Are you, are you comfortable with the, with the distinction that is drawn between women can fantasize about, about rape and sexual domination or violence and not that doesn't mean or endorse sexual violence, I get that. But do you not find the fantasy in itself a kind of problematic construct? I mean, again, it's so interesting that the different ways, you know, we keep coming to this point of like, I always at this point say, well, let's ask more questions of women hmm. because lots and lots and lots of women fantasize about submission or spanking or being dominated in some way, they do. But that's do. disturbing. Well, okay, but that's a separate question. I mean, it's related, but my fr what I'm first interested in is asking these women more questions. So one thing I'm telling you is, if you have a lover who's not spending enough time arousing you, you will get your heart rate up, which sends blood to your inner and outer labia, to your clitoris, helps you lubricate. If you have a, an, a fantasy that has an element of edge or danger to it that has, I'm not endorsing this, I'm just saying that many women who are not being properly attended to by their lovers um, are drawn to s &M imagery because it boosts the autonomic nervous system response and gets them over the edge of arousal into but orgasm. But wasn't it you, if, I'm, if I remember this correctly, who wrote about a psychotherapist or a therapist who was charged with rape and then was let off because he said that the, the woman he was counseling. Okay, that. well, I read about somebody who, and the woman he was counseling had, had rape fantasies. I mean, that's nonsense. That's horrific, appalling nonsense, and everyone involved in that should be sent to prison. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, the other thing I want to say is we don't live in a culture that says to women, have fantasies, or explore your body, or masturbate. We live in a culture that says to women, no, 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 and if you do, you'll get raped, and it's your fault. So if this is the message, thank you. If we never, like I looked at sex education for, in the West and everywhere except Sweden, girls learn about their fallopian tubes and AIDS, but nothing about their clitoris or orgasms or pleasure. You know, whereas boys do learn about ejaculation and wet dreams and sex education. Seriously. So, you know, you can go on Wikipedia and look up, 
vagina and not learn anything if you're a 16-year-old girl about how you function sexually. So where I'm going with this is if we don't live in a culture that says to girls and women, know your body, think about what gives you pleasure, do what gives you pleasure, your pleasure is important. We give women the opposite message. I'm not surprised that so many women have fantasies in which it's not their choice. Because if it's not their choice, he just you know, I was tied up, he just raped me, whatever, they can allow themselves to think about pleasure without feeling guilt. It doesn't surprise me that so many women fantasize about it being overwhelmed or swept away or, yeah. It doesn't surprise you, but does it bother you? Look, everything that suggests that women are maybe internalizing exactly. <coughs> domination exactly. scenarios could be bothersome, but we don't know what whether men are also imagining being tied up. I mean, we just don't have that data, right? So, why is that funny? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is, the reason I keep hesitating, and I'm not, I don't want to say, yes, those, you know, it <laughs> bothers me that women are having these nasty fantasies. Women are always being shamed for their sexual lives, and I don't want to shame any woman for the sexual life she may be having. You, you wrote saying that a society in which there is, um, women are more often naked than, than men reminds you of the inequality of, of it all. In, in daily ways, and isn't that as true today as it was in the 1990s? The, in, the inequality of what, what was the word? You said how everywhere you looked and you did this deconstruction of advertisements and how many naked women were used to sell cars or perfumes or, you know, whatever. And you said that men were not, you know, that there was a, a, a double standard mm -hmm. in the way male nudity and female nudity were, were, were handled, whether in advertisements, cinema, popular culture, <coughs> and that spoke to a basic inequality. Is that mm -hmm. as true today? Less. <coughs> it, there's less inequality. I'm so sorry. Um, I do see, you know, again, I predicted, and again, it's not that I'm particularly smart, but it was so obvious that men would be colonized by the beauty myth because consumer culture needs new markets. And sure enough, whatever, 23 years later, now young men growing up do feel like they have to have those, you know, abs or, you know, whatever, be hairless or whatever it is that is the fashion. I'm not sure what it is in southern India, but there's a lot of hairlessness going on in North America. Um, and uh, so I think young men and young women, especially with pornography, interestingly, feel inadequate in more similar ways now than they did in 1993 when I wrote the book. Um, but I do still, yeah, I mean, I do still feel like the inequality is built in. I mean, in New York, pornography is pretty much on the street and I find it quite relaxing that I don't see it on the street here, although I may be in the wrong neighborhood, but um, <laughs> maybe different laws. Uh, it's in the laptop. No. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do find it kind of demoralizing, again, as the mother of a daughter, or just as a woman to be faced with these constant, you know, objectified images of naked women and, and not, like, would my mood go up if it was wallpaper of naked men all over the place? Maybe slightly, you know, it's... Um, <laughs> but it, it definitely reinforces inequality, yes. Though I remember uh, reading an essay by Germaine Greer where she argued that they, they'd done this whole experiment where they said, okay, we want equality, so we're going to have male center spreads and see how women react to them. And women did not actually react to them necessarily in the same way that men did. And you wrote about this in The Beauty Myth as well when you said that women would be willing to look at men as sex objects as well, but women were either conditioned, I don't know now whether they were conditioned or not, to look at men as human beings first. Right, that's changing. You, you're not gonna like anything I'm saying. <laughs> that's, an, I, did, I did say, and I've always believed, that feminism always makes a mistake in ever thinking women are better than men, because they're not, mm. and that given the opportunity, women will be just as objectifying and inhumane. Look, I'm Jewish, and this is relevant to what I'm about to say. If you're Jewish and you have relatives who either died or survived the Holocaust, you know that ordinary people can get debased and turn into monsters under the right circumstances. And you never forget this. So women can turn into monsters, you know, and it's wrong to essentialize their higher nature. And where I'm going with this is that now there's 
um, industries in Western African countries where Northern European women who want to get laid by young men um, do sex tourism and go to these villages and have sex with these big, handsome young men and pay them. And it's an economy of prostitution. Um, that was inevitable, that was gonna happen. And consumer capitalism is allowing these women to treat these young men as the way that men have always treated women in the sex industry. Um, so, I, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, except that, uh, you know, I, I hear plenty of young women on college campuses in North America, it may be quite different here, I don't know, talking about hookups with young men in exactly as soulless and exploitative a way as young men talk about hookups with mm -hmm young women, I think that, I guess where I'm going with this always is, I'd rather talk not about gender uh, war that inevitably makes one gender prey and the other gender a predator, but what happens to all of us when we live in a society that tells our kids it's nothing but how you look, it's nothing but how much money you have, it's nothing but how you can do sexual things to this other human being and get as much pleasure as you can and discard them. That's that's what worries me. Hmm. I have to open it up to the audience for questions, but just, just one last question to you. It's interesting that you question this essentialism because it, it's really problematic when women say, oh, if there were more women in politics, politics would be different. If there were more women in media, it would be different. Yet the fact that the numerical disparity continues, yet the fact that men are constructed, especially women in, in, in public, you know, who have a public profile, hmm. they are deconstructed even today in a different way than, yes. than men. Yes. So, I just want to say, I do agree that when more women are in politics and media, things change, but it's because of self-interest, because stakeholders bring their own needs to the table. It's not because women are better, it's because they'll, you know, women journalists will pay attention to stories that they think are being missed, and women investors will invest in areas that they think men overlook if they think that it's good for them. Mm. All right, let's just open, we have, I think we have about 10 minutes left, so we can take a few questions. So, yeah, okay, let's start with you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. I have a question like this, this uh, do this discrimination start from the parents itself, uh, from family? I will give an example like uh, 16 year girls accomplished by her 8 year uh, brother to receive her from her coaching to back home. And that boy feels I am stronger than her and she feels she needs a company every time throughout his life. So his parents are responsible for this or not? Does discrimination begin with parents who will set their sons uh, freer than they will set their daughters. Yes, for sure. I mean, again, I don't want to be culturally ignorant. There may be reasons that parents might treat boys and girls differently in a culture in which, for instance, girls are so endangered in the street. Um, but I think if you are parents facing that situation, you have to role model always that girls and boys are equally valued and equally loved and may need different strategies at different times. Okay. Any more questions? Just one minute. I'm trying to see if there's anyone this side. How come none of the women here have questions? Is it because Excuse you me? The, the lady here in the second row, please. Can we get her a mic? <coughs> one minute, one minute. Just take the mic, ma'am. Yes. From Just the way, from hold the way, it closer, yeah. From the way rape has been highlighted in Indian media, you would think that every day women on the streets are pulled out and raped. It is not happening like that. There's one but rape every 20 I, I, minutes, ma'am. It's yeah, not every day. It's yeah. one rape every no, 20 minutes. No, but uh, I mean, uh, it portrays a different picture about Indian culture and society. I agree with her. Everybody has faced. In India, all of us have faced whatever she has talked about. But at percentage-wise, I would not say that it is as dangerous as it is portrayed in the media. And okay. I... The lady in the front row here, please, if we can get her a mic. Oh, I don't think me? we should be defensive and make it an issue of self-image. It doesn't when it comes matter. To it doesn't matter whether it's one rape or a thousand rapes. A rape is a rape, and it's an assault. I cannot, I cannot go with the idea whether I'm a feminist or not, or I'm a humanist. That is a, a hypocrisy. This humanist business. You see, I am maybe a feminist, but I say a rape. One rape, two rapes, three rapes, it doesn't make a difference. It's an assault and it is the direct, uh, re the direct result of patriarchy, yeah. which gives males all the powers and females all the submissive things. Right. I, do, I, I I'm almost inflamed.
when I, when I hear that somebody has suggested that in India situation is not bad. India's situation is worse than what the media portrays. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I agree. Yeah. Sorry I, to I, I wanna, Hello, ma'am. I want to, can I jump in for a it's, minute? You know, what, this is so, so important. And in a way, I, I think we get bogged down when we look at any country as better or worse because it absolutely sucks all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to tell you in my own country, you've got a six in 1,000 chance of prosecuting a rapist if you bring charges, right? It's, so, so where I'm going with this is flipping it around. I want to push a little bit. It is the direct result of patriarchy, but that almost leaves it too abstract. The, it's the direct result of these people not getting arrested and sent to prison for decades. And so the thing to do, what, what I want to tell you, thank you, what I want to tell you is in countries where they actually start to arrest and prosecute and convict rapists, people stop raping. You know, rape is a, a crime of opportunity. That's what's so evil about it. That's why I say, look at the men, look at the men who are raping. And so what I'd love to see come out of this gathering and the scandals that there have been in India, just like I say this in Britain and the United States, is a push to get you know, these crimes reported, investigated, prosecuted, convicted, and to have convictions reflect the lifetime damage that, that rape oh, can cause. In the last one month, two Supreme Court justices have been uh, uh, have been uh, charged with sexual charged harassment. With I as know. Being entered. Oh How my can God. we say this? How hypocritical can we okay. be? I would like to know. Okay, I have five uh, minutes left. The young girl there. Yes, yeah. please. The standing there. there. Uh, this uh, question of mine is also about the rape situation in India. There's a popular opinion that uh, the Indian society is very sexually regressive, which is one of the main reasons for the, you know, the high uh, level of rape situation here. And what is, I, I would want to know, what's your opinion on prostitution? Do you think legalization of prostitution could help? Uh, okay, you're staying out of that one? <laughs> no, no, I'm dying to argue, but the floor is yours. Wait, I didn't quite understand. <laughs> She said, if she was, said mm -hmm. is sexual repression a reason for sexual oh, violence gosh. and is pro would legalizing prostitution yeah. make no, any no, difference? No, 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 no. Look, rape, like, when, when can this be something that we already know? Separate, yeah. The, Rape is not about sex. You can have, you know, Amsterdam, legalized prostitution. They rape people. You don't rape someone because you're horny and don't have a sexual outlet. You rape someone because you want to injure them and oppress them and harm them and negate them. Um, it's a crime. It's a violent crime. The fact that it's done with a penis is almost irrelevant. All right, I, th I think this might be the last question here, Excuse the me, lady in the white shirt here. Mom. One minute, sir. It's Who told you that? Oh, that's, that's very shocking. illegal. Isn't that illegal? <laughs> it should be. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's not illegal. Excuse me, ma'am. I have the means to go to a Krav Maga class. I have the means to do self-defense. But what about all the women in India who, who don't have such opportunities? What? Who, you know, who aren't even exposed to these things? What about their self-defense? What about their security? I, I don't think you're... I don't think as a mom, I don't think that you should put up with this level of stress and harassment and collusion by your head of department. You know, whatever privileges you have, it's not okay. Why isn't it illegal for her head of department to say that to her? Because there are private institutions that have attempted to enforce archaic dress codes. They get a lot of media attention. They're mostly thrown out, but it does happen. Okay. Uh, the young lady here uh, in the, that that has to be my last question. I'm sorry. Yeah, Can we give her the mic? Yeah, uh, I do have a mic and this is not a question. It's a just comment. a comment. I just wanted to commend you on being very objective, Naomi, about the hijab. Thank I'm, you. I don't know if I'm the only one in this audience who's wearing a hijab. And I have to tell you, it's, it's a choice of mine to wear a hijab. I didn't wear it all my life, but I do wear it now. And, um, and Excuse me, ma'am. Can I just I'm, hear why? Yeah. Tell well, me what, what led you to make that choice. Well, I'm proud of, um, of what I do, of wearing, of wearing a hijab, because I feel that 
It is my choice to represent my body or wear clothes in the, wear, in the manner that I feel fit. And I feel that, you know, uh, you... Uh, and I think modesty is a very, very important factor for me, and uh, modesty and respect. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that you can wear a hijab and still be very attractive. Mm -hmm. And um, I have never had problems, you know, uh, walking into any audience anywhere in the world. I'm an American citizen, mm -hmm. and uh, and connecting with anyone anywhere in the world. Um, so, and um, I run the Midnight Marathon, I play tennis, mm -hmm. I write for the Hindu. Um, I'm a technologist and I worked for Hewlett Packard in America mm -hmm. and today I live in Bangalore and I work online as an online instructor mm -hmm. for Baker College in Michigan. I do whatever the heck I want to do. Right. So I you're saying you can freedom. be a feminist and wear a hijab. Is I'm that the a, bottom line? I'm not, even, I, I'm not a feminist. I call uh -huh. myself a humanist. Humanist. Because I'm here in India and I see that there's a lot of people, there are a lot of pockets of people that need help. It's not only the women. Right. You know, it's children, it's, it's the poor, it's the illiterate. And I do a lot of work for all of these people because I'm freed up to do that. Mm. You know, and I've made the choice to, uh, to not work for the money so right. that I can actually... Yeah, um, you know, uh, channel my energies towards so whatever it is that I want to do. Thank yeah. you. I think I understand what you're saying, right. which is this is your choice and you're defining it the way right. you want to. I appreciate right. your right. your sharing that. Be right. Because yeah. we're at the end of time, I have to ask you something that I found on your Twitter page. You yes. you you spoke about how the Indian diplomat Devyani Khobragade was treated by the Americans, and I know that you're a very outspoken voice on politics, you're a democracy activist. So just your thoughts on that before we end. Oh God, what a can of worms. Um, <laughs> well, I did finally get my visa after long delays. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, look, I was arrested for standing on a sidewalk in New York, um, you know, under the same draconian laws that she was cavity searched or strip searched violations of civil liberties in my country are out of control. And so, you know, two things happened that are wrong. Well, one thing, we know that she's being treated in a way that I think is inflected by her gender. And you think? I doubt they would cavity search the big old white guys at the embassy, you know. Um, and I know from reading the news here, because it wasn't reported this way in the US, that the US is not obeying international law, and that's never okay. Um, we still have another side of the story to hear, which is I gather the maid has started to speak out. Frankly, I, find, I think there's a lot to this story that's under the surface, because people are being moved from yeah. India to the United States, and you know, it's just being treated so anomalously, given how much impunity diplomats typically have that I think there's a story behind this mm. story, but we know, you know, look, it's wrong to underpay your staff, it's wrong to cavity search people in New York City or anywhere, it's not wrong not to obey international law. All right, Naomi Wolf, we could talk to you forever. Such I think I have to, to say you. thank you from the entire audience for making us think. Thank you. And I think that's the most important thing of all, whether you're a woman or a man. Thank you so thank much you for a so wonderful, much. wonderful thank discussion. You. Thank you, thank wonderful, you. wonderful audience. <laughs>